Well, welcome to my Sky Tonight presentation of the first of 2021. So we have the sky set up here for the evening of the 20th of January 2021. And I'm going to show you the sort of objects that we'll be able to see. Now you've already seen the moon there presented for you. Roughly half phase. And now the sky is beginning to get dark at half past seven at night. The moon there in the centre of the screen. And just to the side of it, we have a very red looking object, which is, of course, the planet Mars, which we'll have a look at in a moment. I'm just going to pull back and show you the whole of the sky. A little bit of the twilight left there still down to the side and put the constellations of the zodiac that mark out the path of the planets across the sky onto the screen for you. So we have Aquarius there down in the twilight, Pisces, Aries where Mars is. Next up, Taurus, the bull. And then of course we move across the sky to Gemini, the twins, and finally Cancer. And these constellations all line up across the sky because they are the path of the planets. This is the line of the ecliptic, this orange line here. This is the line that matches the path of the sun as it marches around the sky, but also is followed by the planets because the solar system is basically a flat disk. So you can see there the moon just to one side of it and Mars there in very orangey colour was just next to that uh, plane of the ecliptic. So we're going to zoom in on Mars now. We dive right in and we can see the planet there and it's two little tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos. Those are very quite tricky to observe. So don't be surprised if you don't see them. You need really quite a uh, professional level of equipment to actually pick those guys up. But if we zoom in a bit further on to the disk of Mars, you'll immediately see that it is not showing a perfect circle at the moment. We've gone past it. We're well ahead of Mars around our orbit now. We passed it in September at what's called opposition, when it was directly opposite the sun in the sky and the Earth was in the, a line in the, the center and beginning to lose the ability to see the detail on it then, but it's still very bright in the sky. And I've picked this particular night because just below Mars in the sky, we can use it as a signpost to find the planet Uranus, which is not normally one that's easy to track down. It's just about visible with the naked eye, but extremely difficult to find. The telescope reveals it to be a small pale greenish white disc and you can usually find a collection of its moons scattered around it. This is because they're orbiting around in the plane of the equator of Uranus, but that is not pointing towards us. It's very much laid out as if we're looking down on the pole at the moment. And so we see the faint rings of Uranus there around the planet and its moons all arrayed around in a group around the outside. Now we'll go and have a look at one of, one of those moons, Titania, in a little bit close up detail, if we can. We'll zoom in as far as possible. And these moons, a collection of about five large moons that have been known for a few hundred years. And these are all decent sized, planet sized objects, pulled themselves round with their gravity and several of them are good candidates for having oceans underneath a protected ice crust and therefore of interest as possible habitable zones for simple life forms. So there's the potential for life even out there in the uh, cold regions of space. Now we've pulled right back and we're going to move to the left a bit towards the uh, constellation of Orion there and the bright star Sirius just risen above the horizon as we're letting time slew forward to 9 p.m. just to bring those constellations well into view. We've also got the Milky Way there. And here we have the very famous constellation of Ursa Major, the plough or the Great Bear. 
There's the stick diagram of the bear with his nose at the top of the screen, and his paws sticking out to the right, tail dropping off the bottom of the screen there. There is the artwork for the great bear, Ursa Major. It's a very large constellation. I think it is, in fact, the largest screen, uh, total sky area of any constellation. Now, if we look at one or two of the objects in the middle of the tail of the great bear, we've got the double star, Mizar, with its companion Alcor there. And you can see those as two separate objects with the naked eye very much easier with binoculars or a small telescope. But with a very, very powerful telescope, we can drill right in on Mizar and discover that it itself is a double star. And if we did the same trick with Alcor, we would also find that that was double. So we have two pairs of stars where the overall pairs are orbiting around each other, making a quadruple star system. Now, just off to the left of the tail of the Great Bear, we can find the first galaxy on our tour, and that's the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is a classic spiral galaxy. You can really see the spiral arms in a beautiful image here. Uh, bring in the Hubble high resolution image, shows it in great detail. You can see the nucleus in the middle and how the spiral arms wind around the outside. That's about 20 million light years away from us. Uh, so it's not the nearest galaxy, but it's in one of the uh, groups that's fairly nearby to us living in the Milky Way galaxy here. So that's the pinwheel galaxy. If we go the other side of the tail of the Great Bear, we find the Whirlpool galaxy, again, a face on spiral. But this time it's in the process of devouring its neighboring dwarf galaxy. You can see how there's a bridge of stars between the two and the dwarf galaxy is getting disrupted by the gravity of its large neighbor. And that's how gravities grow. They, they're cannibalistic. The uh, large gravities eat the smaller ones and grow larger. And the larger they grow, the more gravity they have. So they're able to pull in further objects. Also in the Great Bear, we're going to have a look at the Owl Nebula so called because it resembles the face of an owl when you look at it through a telescope. Uh, it's a, called a planetary nebula, but it's nothing to do with planets. It's the remains of a dying star. A sun-like star has come to the end of its life and puffed off its outer atmosphere to leave behind just the exposed white dwarf dead nuclear core. Another galaxy here, this one's a little bit further away, 45 million light years. And again, it's a spiral galaxy viewed at a bit of an edge on angle here, so harder to make out the spiral arms. So we'll pull back away from there and go the other side of the main part of the bowl of the Big Dipper or the plow. You can see that on the screen there, the four brightest stars. We're going to go up to the left now find another little group of galaxies. The largest one here is Bode's galaxy and this is about ten and a half million light years away from us so relatively close by. It's a spiral galaxy and it's roughly the same as the Milky Way. But just next to it is the Cigar galaxy which is also a spiral galaxy but you can see right in the center a tremendous amount of activity jets of material shooting out from the core. This is because it had a near miss with its larger neighbor, Bode's galaxy, about six million years ago. And a tidal disruption of the gravity of its stronger neighbor has caused all that activity to be triggered off. So that was Bode's galaxy and the Cigar galaxy. Now we're going to look at the little bear, Ursa Major, I'm sorry, Ursa Minor. We've looked at Ursa Major already. Very similar in shape to Ursa Major with the bowl shape and the spoon handle sticking out there. It's supposed to be the tail of the little bear. There he is. And the poor little bear gets swung around the sky by his tail because the star at the tip of the tail there is Polaris, the pole star. You can always see that from the northern latitudes, certainly from Cambridge. It's always in the same place because it's aligned with the rotation axis of the Earth. 
so as the Earth spins underneath it, Polaris seems to stay still. Now, Polaris is a very useful star to astronomers in other ways as well. It's a special kind of star, a yellow supergiant, a Cepheid variable as it's called, to give it its technical name, and these are very useful for estimating distances in the sky and working out how far away the stars are. Now I'm allowing time to spin around and just to illustrate the point that Polaris stays still and the whole sky rotates around it as time moves on. You can see the rotation of the Earth carrying all the other stars in a circle around Polaris. And I could also run time backwards, of course, so we'll run that back to 9pm where we were so that we leave things uh, set up for the next constellation and uh, bring the little bear back to where it started. You can see that's down leading away, the tail leading away down from Polaris down towards the square of the little bear there. So back to 9pm. So we'll pull back away from Polaris now and go back to some of the constellations of the winter sky. And this is the constellation of Taurus the Bull. We have the V shape of the face of Taurus. He has two enormous horns which stick up to the left there and his body and back are, are uh, indicated out to the right. But the rear half of the bull is completely missing. There's the artwork that shows that. If one of his eyes is marked out by Aldebaran, the red eye of the bull, a very uh, bright orangey red giant star here. This is a star a bit uh, more massive than the sun that's reached the end of its life and is about to uh, turn into one of those planetary nebulae. But here's the opposite end of the life cycle of stars. This is a much younger star cluster called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters only about 150 million years old, uh, which is nothing for stars. We can see some hot, bright blue stars there lighting up the remains of the gas out of which the star cluster was formed. That is a really good thing to look at with binoculars. It makes a perfect framed image for them because they're quite large on the sky. Over by the tip of one of the horns of the bull, we have an exploded star a supernova remnant. This is the Crab Nebula. Right in the centre is a spinning neutron star giving out pulses of radio waves, the so-called pulsar. That we detect those pulses coming to the Earth each time the uh, star rotates and uh, it does so pretty rapidly, about 30 times a second. So it's quite an amazing thing to think about. Now we're going to look down below Taurus to Orion the Hunter. You can see Orion's belt there, the three stars in the middle. There's Orion with Taurus up to the right and Gemini, there you can see the feet of the twins of Gemini up to the left. Just below the constellation of Taurus, and we drill into it and we find the bright orangey red coloured star Betelgeuse. This has been misbehaving for the last 12 months in fading and coming back again in brightness and giving scientists a lot of reason to scratch their head. We think it's going to explode as a supernova any time in the next million years or so, but we're not quite sure when. So this misbehaviour got people very excited, but it seems to have calmed down again now. Right in the centre of Orion is the sword handle and it contains this amazing Orion Nebula, a stellar star factory or star nursery where new stars have been born out of a cocoon of gas and dust. And the four bright ones right in the centre there that you can't make out are lighting up the whole of the rest of that with their extreme radiation, giving those beautiful red and pink colours and the brown, dirty, dusty material it's the colder material that's yet to collapse and form new stars and new solar systems. So that's the main Orion Nebula, wonderful sight in binoculars. Now we're going to look just to the star at the left hand of the trio of 
Orion's belt and zoom in a little bit here and we see another couple of regions of glowing gas. We see the Horsehead Nebula where the red pink colour of her uh, glowing hydrogen has a cold dark dusty finger of gas and dust blocking it making that shape of the head of a horse or perhaps a seahorse would be a better description and also the flame nebula there just to the left of the star. Now Ryan is full of these clouds of gas and dust you can see a big red finger of it over to the left hand side curling across the screen and here's another region where a young star formed out of these dirty dusty uh, material has lit up and is reflecting its blue light back off the gas behind. It's called a reflection nebula. We can't actually see the bright star because the thick, dirty, dusty material is obscuring it, but we can see the light bouncing back to us. All sorts of interesting objects in and around this area. But that's uh, the end of the show for tonight. It's uh, just uh, 20 minutes. There is a lot more to see. Uh, but I don't want to make these uh, planetarium shows go on for too long. So we'll bring that to a close there now. And I'll just leave you with a view up into the sky. There's the constellation of Auriga with the bright star Capella. And Capella is the name of our Cambridge Astronomical Association newsletter. So if you Google CAA Capella, you can find our newsletters online and learn more about the, the night sky. Thank you very much for watching. Do click subscribe and you'll get notified when the next 